Good morning, all my dear colleagues, friends, and dignitaries. We are here to present the perspective of Centre for Digital Sciences, what we have done in the recent past, and what is our future perspective. So, when we say the Department of <coughs> Centre for Digestive Sciences, it includes HPV and transplant surgery, it includes surgical gastroenterology, hepatology, organ transplant anesthesia, and critical care. The faculty is a long list, um, which includes an eminent personalities, my colleagues, uh, my fellows from the Department of Surgical Gastro, HPV Surgery and Neurotransplant, Department of Hepatology, <coughs> Department of Anesthesia, Department of Organ Transplant and Critical Care. The courses we offer at the Center for Digestive Sciences is MCH in Surgical Gastro. We have got two seats which we get every year. We have MCH in hepatobiliary surgery uh, and liver transplantation one seat every year. We have DM hepatology seat every year. There is also, I think we are one of the few centers which have started uh, this HPV surgery because we are only one of the three centers offering the course of MCH HPV surgery in the whole country. We have also started DM Organ Transplant Anesthesia and Critical Care. We have two candidates taking up this specialty every year. And in the near future, with our rising numbers of liver transplantation, we intend to increase into a fellowship in liver transplantation where we will be offering it to national as well as international candidates will be coming either every three or six monthly. The uh, fellowship is initially what we already had. Uh, it's a running fellowship in Gangaram where we have HPV fellowship and transplant where we get fellows every three monthly. So they come only with the intention of they come with an only an intention of getting exposure to liver transplant. So the idea of getting these fellows is who are already trained surgeons and who want experience in hepatobiliary surgery and liver transplantation want to go back to their to their own. Uh, institute. They are either sometimes serving as associate professors, professors and who just want to get some idea about HPV surgery because they have never been involved in liver transplant and hepatobiliary surgery. So the idea was to look at these, uh, obviously we, we are going to prepare a project for this and take approval uh, from the necessary uh, administration and then we intend to start this in some time. So that's our whole team where without, as you all know, liver transplant or any other surgery in my mind is actually a teamwork. A team leader is as good as his weakest member of the team. This also includes our OT staff and our intensive care unit staff who work tirelessly round the clock, not only in the OT but also in the intensive care unit. We have got a 10 bedded uh, liver ICU which is only dedicated to liver transplant patients and we also intend to increase this facility by adding 8 more beds. So slowly over a period we are going to have about 16 to 17 bedded dedicated liver transplant ICU. There are a lot of, uh, since we have been practicing liver transplant in more than almost one and a half to two decades. We have done many cases, some of them we have listed here. We have done living donor liver transplant in a small child which was weighing only 4.5 kg. We have about a 10 year follow up in this child. We have also done probably the world's first where in a 3 year old child we have done living donor liver transplant with IVC reconstruction and open heart surgery and we have an 8 year follow up in this child as well. We have done liver transplant in a child with hemiparesis again which was first in India. We have done liver transplant in a pregnant female who presented to us with hepatitis E related acute liver failure. Living donor liver transplant in Indian juvenile childhood cirrhosis. Now the name uh, nomenclature has changed but when we did that time it was called as Indian childhood cirrhosis. We were the first to perform the first living related intestinal transplantation. We have done many combined liver and kidney transplants dual lobe transplant which means that we take two donors and put it in a one recipient so 
uh, we get right or left loop from two different donors and put it in one individual. Specifically, when since the time I have been associated with Mahatma Gandhi Hospital and the Institute, we have done the first cadaver transplant in the state of Rajasthan, first living donor liver transplant again in the state of Rajasthan, the first combined liver and kidney transplants in the state of Rajasthan, first living donor liver transplant for acute liver failure again in our state. We have been doing complex vascular reconstructions. So these all things we have been doing it uh, at Mahatma Gandhi Institute, but. Since the Center for Digestive Sciences is not only transplant, we do fair bit of GI work, fair bit of HPV work. So just to uh, tell and inform my rest of my colleagues is that we do adult and pediatric HPV work as well, wherein whipple surgery, either open or minimally invasive, we have done about closing to 100. We have done about liver resection, which is again more than 75. We have done esophageal surgeries, RUA and my hepatico jejunostomy. That is many times we get patients referred from outside who have undergone a bile duct injury post laparoscopic cholecystectomy and we seem to have a very large series of these patients whom we have operated. We also sometimes because of the experience in our liver transplant we are able to help our uh, renal transplant or urology colleagues where they encounter renal cell carcinoma with a tumor in the IVC when we have to get a control of the IVC, intrahepatic, suprahepatic and take a puta control and, and take out the uh, tumor. Many retroperitoneal mass may or may not in, be infiltrated in the liver. This was the first emergency transplant or the first transplant, living donor liver transplant for acute liver failure done in the whole state of Rajasthan and had got wide uh, publicity. <coughs> Coming to the number of transplants we have been performing, I have been fortunate enough to be part of this program since the year 2018. I remember the time when uh, we used to come only on Thursdays, there was no department of GI surgery at that time. We used to schedule our uh, operations only on Thursdays and eventually the department grew. We had a lot of my colleagues joining in, Dr. Ajay, Dr. Kapoor, and eventually the department has grown to a big level now. So in 2018 and 19 we were able to perform uh, one and three transplants that year. But in 2020 again there was, because of the COVID, our operation theatre obviously was shut down, not only us, but the whole country. So the numbers at that time were not, uh, we couldn't do transplant during that period. But again, we restarted this in 21 and 22. And if you can look at the numbers, the, the numbers have significantly increased. This year also, only in until July, we have done about 19 transplants. So that is the graph, uh, as you can see. That's the, number, <clears throat> that's the number of transplants, which is living donor liver transplant, which is steadily going up in the last year, year and a half. And that's the deceased donor transplant, which has remained um, static at this level, but we intend to increase that as well. And our expected uh, increase in the number of transplants, we aim to reach about 50 to 60 in a year, at least this year, if we can able to achieve it, and then slowly go up and build it up to two transplants a week and then further go up. So coming and looking at the etiology, what are the patients we are looking at in transplant? Most of our cases had alcoholic liver disease, but some of them had got NASH. So these are the major causes uh, of our transplant uh, indication, followed by hepatitis cellular carcinoma, hepatitis B virus, and then the other smaller causes like uh, butt carry syndrome, autoimmune hepatitis, only one case of hepatitis C and one for acute liver failure. Transplanting or operating is very important, but what matters is what is the outcome, and that is what defines our center. So when we look at, when we, we, we analyzed our 65 transplants we have done till date, and we looked at the parameters, so we had got chronic liver disease in about 44 patients whom we transplanted, a 7% mortality at 60 day, 2 month mortality, which, which leads to a, a survival rate of 93% as compared to the standard survival in literature about 80 to 90%. We looked at ACLF. This is a very important group of subgroup of uh, patients whom we have to transplant where acute on chronic liver failure. These patients are usually very sick. Some of them have got one or two organ failure, either respiratory or a renal or a cardiac uh, causes. And these patients also whom we operated, we have got a, a good survival at 84%, which again worldwide, if you compare, we are significantly equally good. 
in, in acute liver failure, we have done only one, or fortunately that patient is still alive, um, and, and that's a 100% survival. Coming to the MELD score, a lot of uh, you would have read about a MELD score, which has been published widely, and anybody who has got a MELD score of more than 25 are supposed to be considered as very sick patients, either here or worldwide. So even in those patients who are very sick patients, more than 25 MELD score, our success rate has been more than 87%. So I would uh, now present the case of 50-year-old patient who presented to us with jaundice and altered sensorium and would like to invite Dr. Karan Kumar, who is from the Department of Hepatology, to take you through this case. Uh, thank you, sir, for the kind introduction and good morning all the dignitaries and my colleagues. Uh, so to begin with the case, so we have a 50-year-old female who had no history of any addictions or comorbidities. The patient had her intake presentation in February 22, that is one and a half years back, when she developed shortness of breath. There was no cough, no fever, no chest pain. Patient was evaluated at a primary health center in Jalawar, where an X-ray was done and which showed a left-sided fluid diffusion. She underwent a diagnostic aspiration of that fluid, which showed a lymphocytes of 450 and AD of 49. As the normal practice is with the lymphocytic predominant fluid diffusion with elevated ATT, she was started on empirically ATT, antitubercular drug, the standard category 1 antitubercular drug, rifampicin, isoniazid, pyrazinamide and ethambutol. Before starting of this uh, ATT, the pre-ATT LFTs are not available with us. Uh, after two months of taking this antitubercular drug, patients start developing jaundice. Her urine become yellow, her eyes uh, start appearing yellow. With the jaundice was painless, progressive, and it was preceded by prodrome in form of low-grade fever, malaise, and arthralgia. There was no feature which could suggest chronicity like ascites, bleed, melina, hematomasis, or any abdominal pain. Uh, her ATT was stopped by the physician who had started it, but despite stopping ATT, after 10 days of onset of jaundice, patient developed altered sensorium, she developed drowsiness, her behavior became irritable, which was heading toward a stuporous state. In this state, she was referred to MGH. When she reached MGH emergency, her pulse rate was 95 beats per minute, the respiratory rate was 16, BP was normal, temperature was, she was afebrile, uh, SpO2 was, she was maintaining situation on room air. In the general examination, only positive clinical finding was a deep pick dress. Apart from that, there was no pallor, no flubbing, no cyanosis, edema, or any lymphadenopathy. So, since there was a jaundice which warrants an abdominal examination, in abdominal examination, there was nothing remarkable in the inspection. The abdomen was flat with centrally placed umbilicus, no dilated veins, scars, sinuses, earlier sites were normal. Superficial palpation revealed normal temperature, there was no tenderness. In deep palpation, liver was palpable just below the right coastal margin. The liver was soft in consistency, having a rounded edge, smooth surface. Liver was moving with respiration. In percussion, when we assessed the liver span, it came out to be 8 cm. Normal liver span in a healthy female is in the range of 10 to 12, but her liver span was around 8 cm. There was no any abnormality in the auscultation. There was no adventitious brewing, venous arm. Other system examinations were, cardiovascular respiratory system examination were unremarkable. Uh, the other complaint of the patient was altered sensorium. So we proceeded to the neurological evaluation. Patient was conscious but was not oriented to time, place or person. She was agitated, had to be restrained to take the samples and other monitoring. Her deep tendon reflex were pressed. Planters were bilateral extensor. If we go by the Glasgow coma scale, she was fitting into E4, B4, M5. That is a total score of 13 out of 15, mild disability. So here I would like to put a question to the audience. Uh, what is the best way to assess sensorium in a patient who is suspected to have liver disease? Is Glasgow Coma Scale an ideal tool to assess to sensorium in such a patient? Is it, I think, an answer? Uh, very true. This Glasgow Coma Scale was mainly for head injuries and for intracranial bleeds. It was for a liver patient. This doesn't hold very true. I will come into the next slide. To assess sensorium in a liver patient, there is a classification system known as West Heaven classification of hepatic and capillopathy. 
the patient is suspected to have liver disease, neurological assessment is based on best seven classification. It includes three parameters, what is the level of consciousness, what is the personality and the intellect of the patient, and what are the neurological signs. Like this patient, this patient had confusion, she was somnolent, she was disoriented to place, she was having aggressive or agitated behavior, estrexis, uh, was not, could not be assessed in this patient, she had positive Babinski sign and hyperactive reflex. So she was heading toward grade 3 hepatic encephalopathy. Whereas if she was assessed by the Glasgow coma scale, it was a mild the stage of uh, altered sensorium, whereas in West Heaven it is grade 3. She was almost heading toward the grade 4 or the complete coma. So summarizing, it's a 50-year-old female with tubercular pleural effusion, developing jaundice on anti-tubercular drug, and developing altered sensorium which will label at hepatic encephalopathy grade 3 after 10 days of jaundice. So what is the differential diagnosis? If a patient who had a history of tubercular effusion on ATT, developed jaundice, then altered sensorium, so what are the different possibilities which come into mind? Again, questions for the medicine resident. Speak loudly. Good. Anything else is a differential diagnosis. You can't stick to the one diagnosis alone. Good. Uh, cause being drug and See, the common thing remains the common patient having jaundice, then developing encephalopathy. First thing is hepatic, uh, the acute permanent failure, acute liver failure, with drugs being the primary cause. But still, ALF again is a diagnosis of exclusion, hepatic encephalopathy is a diagnosis of exclusion. Other things has to be ruled out, she already had a history of tubercular pleural effusion. Though there was no any feature of suggestive of progression, still we want to rule out any cerebral CNS involvement with the tuberculosis. Metabolic cause, hypoglycemia simply can cause altered sensorium. Uh, patient is not consuming and having hypoglycemia or any other metabolic abnormality could lead to these features. And sepsis with more very low down the possibility, she doesn't have any features, hemodynamically she was stable, so still we want to rule it out. And again, any organic cause like intracranial bleed or any uh, stroke which has led to this uh, altered sensorium should always be kept in mind. So we have to proceed with the evaluation part. This was her baseline evaluation. As you can see that her INR was significantly raised. Her growth thrombin time was 55 seconds and INR was 5.6. Bilirubin was 20.9 with direct fraction of 16.3. Her aspartic transaminase was 1083 with alanine transaminase of 870. Albumin was 3.1. This was clearly suggestive of a severe acute hepatic cancer leading to hepatocellular jaundice and severe coagulopathy. Since she had a history of tuberculosis, tuberculosis, we got an X-ray, we showed now a normal chest X-ray with no blunting. Viral screen has to be ruled out in all. The A and D can be a confounder in this patient, can lead to similar presentation while hepatitis A and E was negative. Autoimmune worker was also done, which was negative. Now to establish this to be as hepatic and cephalopathy, we did an ammonia level which come out to be 184, her lactate was 6.5. So final diagnosis with all after having this blood test was acute liver failure, probable cause. We have ruled out viral and we have ruled out autoimmune. So the final etiology of the uh, cause of the acute liver failure was kept as drug-induced liver injury. And the complete drug could be any. Out of the four first-line ATT drugs, three are hepatotoxic. Pyrazinamide is the most one, Epampis in the commonest one, and isoniazid also. So these three are the commonest hepatotoxic agent. And another thing I would like to highlight is even after stopping the drugs, if the injury has set in, the progression to the liver injury or the progression to liver failure stage can continue. Like this patient, she developed jaundice, her ATT was stopped. Despite of that, after 10 days, she developed progress into a state of liver failure. So drugs wash up takes a longer time, the injury can still persist, even after stopping the drugs. Uh, another thing I would like to highlight for the sake of resident is, now there is a term known as acute liver injury. Whenever there is any hepatic insult, the first manifestation will be the raised transaminases or the jaundice. Then if there is raised INR, if INR is more than 1.5, then it changes from jaundice to acute liver injury. That is the time the intervention should come in. Only then you can prevent the progression to ALF or can identify those patients who are more likely to develop this ALF. Like this patient, when she developed jaundice, could be she must be having the INR of more than 1.5, she was having already having acute liver injury, so she was heading into a state of acute liver failure. But INR was not done, we have only a jaundice. So if INR is prolonged, then the patients need 
attention and patient needs the uh, admission so that the progression to acute liver failure should be uh, stopped or hampered or could be identified in the earlier stage. So any patient with jaundice, even if it is viral, even if it is drug induced, whatever you are suspecting, if INR is raised, INR is more than 1.5, raise an alarm, patient can be headed for acute liver failure, the injury is severe. It indicates injury is severe. And from acute liver injury to acute liver failure, only one clinical present difference, encephalopathy. First is jaundice, raised INR, acute liver injury, when they develop encephalopathy, it is acute liver failure. This is the whole spectrum, jaundice, ALI, ALF. So, principal etiologies of the acute liver failure, commonest are the viral hepatitis A, B, E, drugs, paracetamol, antitubercular drugs, toxins like the mushroom, some out, uh, outskirts mushrooms can be the cause, other like Wilson's autoimmune pregnancy myth can be pre-eclamptic uh, pre liver failure, health, fatty liver of pregnancy, vascular causes like butt carry or the hypoxic hepatitis. Uh, another interesting thing is the geographical variation in the etiology of failure. As you can see that in India, the most common cause of acute liver failure is viral, followed by drugs like this our patient had. Whereas if you will look at the western countries, USA, UK, uh, uh, the European countries, the prominent cause of acute liver failure is paracetamol poisoning. Here paracetamol overdose is the most common cause of acute liver failure, which is not seen in our country at least, but a very rare. So when... Uh, we have to manage a patient with acute liver failure. There are three major questions which we have to address. First is, what is the chances of survival without transplant? Is there any chance to predict, uh, is there a chance of spontaneous recovery? Second is, if there is no chance of spontaneous recovery, whether the patient is fit to undergo transplant or not. ALF is a very dynamic disease with a rapid course. In few hours, patient can become too sick to be transplanted. I will give you an example. Yesterday night only we got ALF from Dulab Ji. He was, he was shifted here at 10, uh, 10 p.m. in the night and at by 4 a.m. in the morning, he had fixed that attitude. We can't transplant him. He gave us a window of only 6 hours. So ALF is such a dynamic disease. Within few hours, patient can become unfit to transplant, non-salvageable practically. Then third thing to answer is consideration of survival potential after transplant. What are the chances, if we transplant him, what are the chances that he will survive post-transplant? He will tolerate the surgery and he will survive. These are the three major questions we have to address. So to answer the first question, there is a criteria laid down which is universally accepted. This is the King's College criteria. Uh, as I have already told, paracetamol is a major cause in the West, so they have divided acute liver failure due to the paracetamol and due to non-paracetamol. We have more focused on the non-paracetamol acute liver failure. If INR is more than 6.5, this single criteria in acute liver failure justifies transplant. There is very little chance of spontaneous recovery. Or if INR is less than 6.5, uh, based on etiology, age, interval between jaundice and encephalopathy, bilirubin and INR, uh, if three out of the five polling criteria are met, patient is a candidate for transplant. Our patient, her age was more than 40 years, bilirubin was more than 17.5, she was coagulopathy with INR more than 3.5, duration of between jaundice and cephalopathy was 10 days, etiology is drug induced, which is a non favorable etiology. I believe even if three criteria are met, she is a candidate for transplant, for her, all the five criteria were met. And uh, regarding the third question, what are the chances of survival post-transplantation? In earlier stages, the chances were very little less. Like you can see from the graph in the decade of 1990 and 2003, the chances of survival was around 50 to 60 percent. With now the advent of modern techniques and refinement of the surgery, the chances of trans survival post-transplant are in the tune of 80 percent. So going by the thing. There was no confusion that patient required transplant, so family was concerned for the need of urgent liver transplant. She had a very well knit family. Her three sons all wanted to be the donor. They came forward for evaluation and target was to keep the patient stable till we complete the donor workup. It was a race against time. Donor evaluation, I can tell you, it's a very detailed, elaborate process. We have to do the blood investigation, the CT scan, the MRI, and another plethora of tests, the cardiac evaluation, ECG, ECO, all the things. In a routine, these tests will take nearly five to seven days, but we have to complete those tests in acute liver failure in five to six hours. Second is to prevent the brain uh, patient stable. 
the patient are, as I have already told, are very sick. Any time they can have brainstem herniation or the, with such a bad INR, they can have bleed, intra-abdominal, intracranial, which can make them unfit for transplant. Third thing, along with the medical, the third thing in a case of transplant is the ethical clearance. There is an ethical committee clearance set up by the government which tells about the ethical aspect, whether there is no financial transaction involved in the transplant. So there is again a huge list of paperwork which has to be done. So all the three things we have to complete within, a, I will say, stipulated time of 8 to 10 hours. That is the maximum time we have for their managing acute liver failure to take them for transplant. Just a brief overview for the organ specific thing. The patient had a very bad INR, they can bleed any time, we have to manage the coagulopathy. With no liver, no functioning liver, they are prone to develop infection with so many lines within situ tubes, arterial lines, they can catch infection any moment which we have to take care. Hemodynamics, it's a purely vasodilated state, patient can go into shock any moment. Pulmonary, during an intubated state, they can develop VAP, anything. Metabolic hypoglycemia, hyponatremia, hypophosphatemia, hypokalemia, all the metabolic things we have to take care. But the most important thing to be assessed that to manage this patient with acute liver failure is brain. Our gut meta break down the protein into ammonia, that then liver convert this ammonia into urea which is excreted by kidney. When liver is failed, liver is not working, the ammonia, excess of ammonia which is produced goes into the brain. This ammonia gets converted into glutamine in the astrocyte which leads to their swelling and cerebral edema. If it goes uncontrolled, it can lead to brainstem herniation leading to brain death and patient will become non-transplantable. So, our patient, the tools, clinical tools we use to assess intracranial hypertension. First of all, clinical. Cushing reflex, the old school, Cushing reflex, that is exactly the reverse of shock. What happens in shock? Hyper, uh, hypotension, tachycardia. What happens in Cushing reflex? Hypertension, bradycardia. If a patient in shock suddenly develops, no, he was requiring 2 ml of norad, suddenly norad requirement dips down and his BP increases, that is not a good sign, that is a bad sign. Patient is having cerebral edema. It is reverse by the other cases. Pupils, if the pupils from reactive become non-reactive, again indicates cerebral edema and herniation. Another tool which is an important one is optic nerve shoot diameter. It is an easily available, can be done with the bedside ultrasound. Just place the probe over the eyeball. You can see the eyeball here and behind the eyeball there is the optic nerve. Uh, you can see here. In the optic nerve, 3 millimeter behind the optic nerve, the thickness of the optic nerve, it gives a direct measurement of what is happening in the brain, what is the edema level. If optic nerve diameter is more than 4.5 millimeter, it indicates raised ICT. Transcranial Doppler, we can assess the middle cerebellar artery from the and the resistive index of that, and that can reversal of uh, middle cerebellar artery flow can also tell about the raised ICT. Our patient has ammonia of 182, after 12 hours it increased to 202, ONSD was 4.6 which increased up to 6.2, pupil reaction from breast was becoming sluggish till the time we were completing the workup. To keep the patient stable, we have to start the patient on CRRT, the continuous veno-venous hemofiltration dialysis mode. Again, I would like to address CRRT is a dialysis modality, it is not only for the nephrologist. We hepatologist uses that much as the nephrologist use. <laughs> the CRRT, the role of CRRT is to filter out all the toxins. It is like a continuous process. What is the role of kidney? To filter out the toxins from the body. It is a continuous process. The blood goes into the CRRT machine. It continues to filter out the ammonia and the other toxins from the blood so that the edema don't set in. So now it's about a practice from ALF. Just the time they enter into the emergency, it is like a normal treatment modality. They are started on. CRRT so that they are kept stable. So on this CRRT machine, patient was shifted to ICU, donor evaluation was completed. Now the next challenge is for Dr. Ganesh to manage the patient, to take the patients in the intraoperative period. I would like to invite Ganesh to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ganesh. Good morning, uh, respected senior faculty member, uh, colleagues and dear students. Now I will continue with the intraoperative management. As uh, discussed by Dr. Ganesh, uh, on three anesthetic examinations, all pupils are valid to 3 mm, sluggish responding to light. Optic non uh, optic nose diameter is 6.2 mm. To rule out to rule out uh, uh, whether intracranial bleed or cerebral uh, herniation is present, we did a CT. Uh, luckily, we didn't find like uh, anything, so we shifted this patient inside the OT. Uh, the main challenges uh, during intraoperative management are first is the as you see, her PT was 97 and INR is 8. So we uh, arranged all the blood products and we did a take. Take is a thrombo uh, elastography. It, uh, it is a bedside, simple, 
point of care of Bogolis and says it is help, it is helpful in guiding uh, what blood products patient need. So it uh, it give a, give an idea about the all process of the coagulation starting from the clot initiation propagation to the febrile disease. Uh, as you see, the patient's INR is eight, but his take value take graphic near normal. So uh, on this take, we can able to put a central line, heart line, and start the uh, surgery. The next challenge is hepatic encephalopathy. Uh, so proper neuro monitoring is very important, as uh, discussed by Dr. Karan. We, uh, in in uh, addition to see the pupils and optic nerve diameter, we also did this picture index monitoring. This is a EEG based method which quantifies the depth of anesthesia. Uh, the piece lead is just like the ECG lead, which is attached to the forehead of this patient, and we uh, the monitor gives the value ranging from 0 to 100. 100 means patient is completely conscious, awake, oriented, and 0 means there is completely cortical silence. To, uh, we targeted our uh, drugs to keep a base value between 40 to 60 as we want patient deep, as we don't want any uh, similar to the patient, we keep this value near 40. If during intraoperative course, if this value comes down, like from 40 to 20, it means there is rising intracranial pressure. So we have to manage with deeper mannitol and hyperventilation. Uh, like uh, this monitor also helpful during post-operative period, like after liver transplant, if this value increase from 40 to 50 or 60, which means uh, hepatic encephalopathy started reversing, when patient is doing better. So it is so this monitor is helpful in uh, perioperative uh, management of management of the acute liver failure. These patients are, are high, high risk intraoperative at high risk of hemodynamically uh, hemodynamic uh, instability. So we attach advanced cardiac output monitor like Clotrac. Uh, from where we get idea about the cardiac output, systemic vascular resistance, pulse pressure variation, CVP, so that we can we can uh, uh, able to decide where to give fluid or vasopressors patients. And we we uh, we can also see the response to our uh, in, in, interventions. We keep a targeted map around 75 to 80 to, to maintain adequate uh, cerebral perfusion. These patients have also high risk of acid base and uh, electrolyte imbalance, so we did frequent ABG monitoring and try to correct it. These patients are, are uh, intraoperative at, at high risk of arrhythmia, infection, renal, and lung injury. Uh, we, uh, uh, in, in, intraoperatively, uh, our aim is to protect all these vital organs so that the, uh, uh, till liver started with this function. With the uh, Martha Mandi Hospital is only an institute where all these advanced facilities like uh, uh, thromboelastographies, uh, uh, this monitoring and advanced cardiac output, output monitoring are uh, available in Rajasthan state. Thank you, sir. Uh, I, I'll like to invite our chairman, Dr. Nimish Mehta, sir, for. Thank you so much, sir. As you can all see how difficult uh, liver transplant management is and uh, some of these, what is important has already been enumerated by my colleagues. So it is not only the uh, patient care, but how do they recover, what is their hemodynamic instability. Many a times if you look at people are not willing to put an uh, and, and, uh, IV cannula with an INR of 155, and here we are putting in central lines, we are opening the abdomen, doing a hepatectomy with an INR of 8, we, um, with the pupils and sluggishly reacting, again as it has been rightly pointed out, there is a race against time that we need to check throughout the surgery. If at any point we find that the pupils are dilated and fixed, we may have to stop doing the transplant. So that is very important in acute liver failure where you are running against the time. There are This consent has already been obtained obviously from the family when we counsel them, but the idea is to Push. So I remember this case, we were waiting for the consent, patient was taken in the OR or the operation theatre at 8 p.m. On set, ready, the whole team ready. The signature came at 11 o'clock from the uh, ethical committee clearance. As soon as we got the final signature, we got a go-ahead on the phone call. And even on that permission taken, we started the surgery at 11 p.m. in the night. And it is very good, all this we have said, and this is what the patient was pre-operatively. And this is exactly we want to see 
how the patient is sitting post-operatively. And this, um, one of our nurse was very keen to see a Rajasthani dance and uh, this uh, lady, again obviously we have taken a video with proper consent, was willing to show uh, the Rajasthani dance um, in the ICU post-recovery. So this is now, we seen her yesterday in her follow-up at 15 months, same lady who underwent acute liver failure, uh, liver transplant for the same. So there are many challenging cases we face um, in, in our career. Some of these cases I would like to uh, share with the NGUS team family, where a, a three-year-old young child whom we were discussing some time back had a tumor in the liver, and if you can see, that's the liver tumor. That is the tumor going into the inferior vena cava, and that tumor is also going into the right atrium. So this was an inflammatory fibromyoblastic tumor, IFMT, very few cases have been reported about this. It is mainly benign, causes more obstructive symptoms. Child was very sick and this uh, child eventually, this is the patient, this is a photograph of the child at three years uh, who was very sick, underwent liver transplant from her father with an open heart surgery. And this is the photograph her mother keeps on sending it to us at the age of 10 years where they are celebrating her birthday. Similarly, we have got many such cases where a young six-month-old post biliary atresia. This is how you can see how deeply jaundiced is this girl, and the same girl. You may not believe it, but the same girl. You look at the difference once you have actually transplanted, and once they recover, how do they look like? Look at the joy which the family has when they see their child performing, living as normal as any other child would be living. Some other cases which we have done, we are all we have all heard about living donor liver transplant where you remove, and I'll, I'll be speaking, where you remove one lobe of the liver from a single donor. But we have done that as a dual lobe transplant where in those patients who have got a higher BMI and higher weight, a right lobe or a left lobe from a single donor may not be sufficient. So you may have to take liver from two donors. So that there are various permutations and combinations. You can take right and left, right and left lateral, two left lobes. Again, there are technical difficulties which I'll not go into the detail, but we have done all these various permutations and combinations. Coming to situs inversus totalis, when we say a situs inversus totalis, everything is a mirror image including the heart. Situs inversus alone could be only in the abdomen and the heart could still be on the left, but in this patient we had got situs inversus totalis where we had the heart on the right, liver on the left, stomach on the right, so this was a complete mirror image and doing a donor hepatectomy in this scenario is again uh, technically challenging, again which we have performed. Coming to the indications of liver transplant, there are, as you have already heard about acute liver transplant, we have spoken briefly about acute and chronic liver transplant, but there is chronic liver disease where you require, which is end stage liver disease, where there is no other hope <laughs> except changing the liver. But cirrhosis alone, this, this point I wanted to highlight is just the presence of cirrhosis does not mean that this is a candidate for transplant. Cirrhosis, we further look at the child POOCS criteria where you look at the bilirubin, you look at the albumin, you look at the INR, encephalopathy, ascites, these are the parameters you look at. And if they fall into the category where they need, where there is an end state liver disease, then in those cases they need to be sent for liver transplantation. Some of the patients, if they have cirrhosis but they are associated with a signs of irreversible hepatic decompensation, and this is what is very important. Just only cirrhosis does not mean that we, we transplant such patients. We would like to have some symptoms, only then that is an indication for transplant like varicial bleed, refractory ascites, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, hepatic encephalopathy, hepatic renal syndrome, hepatopulmonary syndrome, development of hepatocellular carcinoma in a cirrhosis or severe impaired quality of life. So when would you like to refer these patients is very important because a perfect timing if it is the patient undergoes liver transplant outcome as you have already seen in our series, the outcome is more than 90%. So when we talk about child book system, all child C 
there is no there is no grade above C. That's the highest grade. All child C grade and those patients in grade B with they have got decompensation ideally should be sent for liver transplant or considered for liver transplantation. So we have been talking about liver transplant but what exactly is little bit brief about liver transplant. There are two types. One is a cadaver transplant, one is a living donor liver transplant. Cadaver transplant has become uncommon as you have seen even in our series uh, we have got more numbers of living donor liver transplant. You do adult to adult or an adult to a child. So in cadaver what do we do? We remove the whole liver out from the patient, take the whole liver from the cadaver donor and put it in, you join the artery, bind the portal vein, but you can see the sizes are pretty big enough because you are taking the full length of the artery, you are taking the full liver, full length of the vessel. We are not getting it and it is, a, it is any, any transplant surgeon's bliss if he receives a cadaver organ because technically it is much more simpler, less demanding operation as compared to a living donor liver transplant because if you can see this is the size of the artery they have to join but if you are doing a living donor this is the right side artery so he will be joining this artery, this smaller right artery. Similarly the right vein, the right hepatic duct, all they are very small in size. So coming to living donor where only a part of the liver is removed from the donor and it is eventually implanted in the recipient. Now many a times we come across with the question that in living donor do you take the full liver? So we take only a part of the liver and liver is the only organ as you all would know which regenerates. So it has got hyperplasia as well as my pathology colleagues will be able to tell me in this. Yeah? Nobody here? Hypertrophy and hypoplasia both. Not every. When you take out the kidney, one kidney, there is only hypertrophy. There is no hyperplasia. This is one organ where you have got hypertrophy and hyperplasia. So, when you remove this much part of the liver also, the remaining part of the liver which is there inside grows back to its original volume in about three months time. Living donor liver transplant involves three different types of operations. One is the donor operation where you are going and two operations are running simultaneously in two theatres. You are doing a donor hepatectomy and eventually you retrieve a graft. Recipient operation where you are doing an explant hepatectomy, you have to remove the uh, liver, the serotic liver. Again, you, as you have seen with the high INR, it is not as easy as we say but without any major bleed or blood loss. You have to achieve hemostasis and once this graft is removed, it is not directly put into the liver, in, in the receiver. You have to prepare that. There are many cases where you have to do complex venous reconstructions for before you take this graft into the recipient and implant. Then you go ahead and implant or reconnect the liver. Coming to the donor selections, we look at usually a close family member, aged between 80 to 55 years of age, preferably either the same blood group as the recipient or blood group O. Usually a recipient with an AB group can receive liver from any donors. 50 to 70 percent of your liver can be safely removed and the remaining liver can regrow or regenerate. So that is one in, a remarkable property of liver. Usually most of our donors are discharged within six to seven days. Again, whenever we select a donor, the first dictum is do no harm in the donor. So there are many protocols which are in place where you have to reject the donor based on age, sometimes metabolic disorder, if they have fatty liver, if they have a low remnant or they have psychiatric disorders, they may have other comorbidities. In these cases we do not accept such donors. The Center for Digestive Diseases and Sciences have been uh, a brainchild of Dr. Swankar sir and the future perspective we look to, to look forward in this is we would like to perform pediatric liver transplant again which has not happened here, intestinal and small bowel transplant, continue with pancreas transplant. We would also like to do complex ABO incompatible. I just spoke to you about the compatibility of the blood group. We can do ABO incompatible liver transplant, simultaneous pancreas and kidney transplant and in the way forward looking for minimally invasive donor hepatectomy. So coming to the uh, new block which has been envisioned, this is, these are the new towers. This will be a silver jubilee block hopefully coming up in two years time in 2025 and um, we have a quick bird's eye view from our management team and this is what we intend to where the center for digestive sciences will be launched. Uh, a few floors will be dedicated to it. That's an entrance lobby. 
and with the vision and the support of the whole MGU MST, we would like this, uh, and we are hopeful that this will be ready in a couple of years' time. And our institute is still the best, but we want to be best and well recognized not only in this country but internationally as well. So there are the the, the plan is is definitely big, and we intend to move forward and follow what has been. Uh, assigned and envisioned. These are the various OPD chambers being shown, the various floors, how the bed or the wards will be located, that's a nursing station. These are the bed areas which will be overlooking outside to give them good sunlight to the patient which is very important in the recovery. Uh, the infrastructure will be as good as any other uh, in the world class, uh, any other institute. <laughs> we, though we have done all these things, but we are nobody apart if we do not have help from the supporting team. So I would like to acknowledge first Dr. M. L. Swankar for his vision. Uh, what he has envisioned and the program has taken off only because of uh, his vision. Full support from Dr. Vikas Varankar, administration of the university, the CCR review team who has helped us put up this uh, slides together. Anesthesiology, very important part and integral part of our team, especially for transplantation. Medical gastro, again an integral part of our team, blood bank and transfusion medicine who gives us blood at even single phone call. In some patients we use only one blood, in some we have to use 20. And uh, we have always had them ever supportive throughout the uh, transplant operation. Department of radiology which includes ultrasound, CT scan, interventional radiology. Nephrology team and renal transplant team where we have done the first combined liver kidney transplant of the state. Biochemistry and Microbiology Department, we are usually on uh, the phone with them, asking them the reports in two hours and sitting on their head. Department of Neurology, Cardiology, Cardiac Surgery and Pediatrics, all, uh, all free time supporting us whenever we need Department of Psychiatry. Um, Dr. Harshil, who was who our senior resident, has helped us put up these slides. And in case I have forgotten inadvertently, uh, I would like to apologize for the same, but I would like to thank and acknowledge the whole Mahatma Gandhi uh, University of Medical Sciences and Technology family for supporting this program. Thank you very much. So the usual risk what we explain to the uh, mortality in donor is 0.5%, which is 1 out of 200. That's the usual risk we explain in the right lobe. When we take the left lobe, the risk reduces to 0.2 percent. So again here, though we are very careful, we do full testing as, as was mentioned by my colleague that the test takes over a trip about 5 to 7 days. We need to assess the donor. The tests we perform on the donor are sometimes more than what we assess in the recipient because we do not wish to put the donor at harm at any cost. So our criteria are pretty stringent so that we do not want the donor to be put at risk. But nevertheless, any surgery is never 100% successful. So 0.5% is what we explain. Fortunately, we have not had any such issues uh, ever in the last 17 years. But we do explain that, this, yes. Further, because uh, the maximum abnormal thing in organ in the body, you will see either in the liver, <coughs> whether it is the arterial or venous or the bile duct or hepatic duct, a lot of anatomical or congenital variations are yes. there. Yeah. So, work of has to be done and it has to be very sort of sort of so you, you may not believe, but uh, we all feel that liver, there is a right artery, left artery, but usually we have got multiple arteries. I have not included the technical uh, details of these cases, but we get many a times two arteries to the right lobe, three arteries to the left lobe, three ducts to the right lobe, and all these uh, complex uh, 
technical and, and anatomical variations you have to keep in mind and with the expertise and experience what we have gained over the years as of now we do not deny based only on anatomical variation initially when the program started we used to take only selective cases now anatomical variation is no longer a contraindication for us because with gaining experience we are able to achieve and overcome those technical difficulties which we have in multiple arteries multiple veins and bindings so the question not only that it is the physiology of all this is the endocrine and exocrine or like all population factors except factor A are synthesized by the liver. liver. So that is why INR, PT, all those things have to be taken care of having support from the blood uh, hospital department is more important. Absolutely. Very important. That is how you can do on INR. Yes. 8 or 10. Yes. Okay. So understand the anatomy and physiology of the liver. Very, very important. Dr. Nimesh, like what is the barrier to a cadaver transplant? How can we improve the numbers? So in addition to the donor, yes. is the retrieval very complex? Is the window period, the golden period too short? Uh, like we are getting cardiac uh, trans uh, hearts and yes. kidneys. Yes. So why are we not getting livers? So no, it is from the organ basically an organ donor, it's a brain stem dead donor. When we say a cadaver donor, it has to be a specific brain stem death. So what I mean by that is there is no neurological activity going on, but the cardiac activity is still continuing. That is how we maintain the oxygenation and the circulation to all the organs. So the organs will still be healthy to be retrieved. That is the first point. Some of the hindrances what we have is uh, awareness of the organ donation. There are a lot of myths around and I, I remember recently we did a uh, Swastha Charcha with the Department of Telecommunication on organ donation, the myths of organ donation. So there are a lot of myths in, in amidst our uh, society where they find that donating a single organ even after the death would mean that the patient will not or the person will not get that organ in the next birth. As in Hindu mythology, we all are, we are a soul and we, we take the, the first, uh, we leave one body and next we go into another body, so maybe we don't. So these myths have to be broken. Brain stem death understanding is very important by even a lot of physicians because they do not understand what is brain stem death. Brain stem death in legal terminology is death. There has been this Human Organ Transplant Act and all this has been done, the work has been done way back in 1994 when this act was passed, where if there is a brain stem is cold, it's not working, the pupils are dilated. There are various tests also to be done to confirm the brain stem death. And if the individual is brain stem death, then we can retrieve the organs. But again, in the, in the common people, they, in, in the society, there is a doubt that if a person comes to the casualty, if there is organ donation going on in the institute, they will they think that this person will always be considered as brain dead. So we would like to re-emphasize from this platform also that the first aim of any doctor, and I'm sure all my colleagues will agree that the first oath we have taken is to save and salvage that patient. So all care has been taken, all efforts are put to see to it that that patient is salvaged in whatsoever possible way. Only when that seems not possible or all the routes are exhausted, that is the time the team would go in and check for brain stem donation. There is a brain stem death certification where there are two teams who will assess the brain stem death at different point in time to avoid any discrepancy. So once that is confirmed, only then the pain or the person will be declared as brain dead. We have another question. Just, just so my question to Dr. Karan, yes. because the therapy Kalmai change is one of the building therapy for acute liver failure. So, in what condition you are going for the CRT? What is your preparation criteria for CRT over uh, TP, therapeutic Kalmai change? Because the therapeutic targeting as per the ASPA category, which comes under the category 1 for the life saving reasons. Yes, sir. sir. Almost from our experience, we can see that in the last uh, year and a half, we have managed almost 48 ALF patients 
Initially, we were using plasma exchange in them, but plasma exchange had a problem. It blunts, uh, blunts out all over the monitoring, monitoring tool. It will filter out the bilirubin, and it will correct the coagulopathy. It doesn't know whether the patient is actually improving or it's our artifactual. Now, the latest guidelines from the American Gastrology Association, they recommend CRRT as a tool to remove the inflammatory mediators, to remove the ammonia, and to remove the toxins. Plasma exchange is an optional thing, it is still not a recommended therapy. The therapy, which is the category 1 therapy, is CRRT. In what condition, at present, most of the Only if the patient is bleeding. Mm -hmm. Our tendency is that we don't transfuse plasma. If the patient falls, we put a dialysis catheter or line. If the patient is losing, instead of giving plasma, we replace it, we give it plasma exchange rather than transfusing plasma alone. Mm -hmm. That is the only indication we are following in acute DLC care. By CCRT, you are avoiding ammonia rise and cerebral edema. That is the primary concern of maybe this is what I feel. Mm, yes. No? Most of the uh, so it's a still grey area. Yeah. Yes. But we are getting good results with CRRT. I can say that almost the recovery rate in ALA with CRRT we are getting in acute evacuation is around 70%, which is too high to claim. But the normal recovery rate is in the range of 30 40. With adopting this technique, we are getting. I think Sarah Sosa can add to this. This is the actual result we were mother, also mother, compared to project it in front of other 70% recovery rate in ALM. And post post transplant there is a different hall together. It's an early allograph dysfunction. There is a different thing, not only ammonia, then the target molecule is TNF, the other inflammatory mediators, we have to remove that. That condition yes, yes, yes. Allograph now, like the antibody mediated reaction we are using. But uh, for acute liver failure, CRRT, CRRT, and CRRT. I would like to answer further your question, Dr. Dr. Recently, I saw a treatment of the patient from the US, right here. She herself is a nephrology doctor there in the US. So she came for IV. So I told her that they are doing almost uh, two kidney transplant a day. Then she asked me what is the ratio of uh, cadaver or uh, brain disease to donor. I said it's most, mostly donor. Her answer was in America, in USA, the cadaver program is this much and live program is very short. Kulta hai. Kulta nahi hai. Kulta se kulta hai. The reason is, what I am saying, the reason, reason is that our neurology department, critical care department, other medicine department, emergency department, they should be all the time conscience to identify, identify the patients and the counseling of the attendants has to be done from the baby. Second ground reality which without uh, uh, criticizing anybody, what has happened in the last year, the government wants to start transplant program. So all transplant, majority of the transplant like heart transplant and kidney transplant, sorry, uh, liver transplant, then in government medical college, except one patient, nobody has heard. And it has spread a bad name for the for the transplant program all over. So all these ego issues and other issues, it is a teamwork should not come because if something okay, the message goes in the patient community that nobody is surviving in the heart transplant, those who are sitting from the SMS they can they must be doing about this. And similarly for the liver transplant, if uh, things are going badly, then it is, uh, it is, I have told this to the health secretary also, that why are you pushing, let, at least survival should be there to international or national standards. But that is unfortunate which is happening. Like in our IVF program, patient will talk to each other. Phone will talk to each other, that your success will be given. यहाँ पर तो सीधी बैठ हो रही है पेशेंट्स की, तो डेट इस गिविंग बैड नेम तू आवर स्टेट, बैड नेम तू दी प्रोग्राम, सो वी हैव तू फाइट इट ऑन दी ग्राउंड तू डेवलप दी डिजीज प्रोग्राम, इफ वी कूट डेवलप दी ब्रेन डिजीज ऑर्गन बनिशिंग प्रोग्राम, इट विल बी द ग्रेट सक्सेस एंड ग्रेट सर्विस फॉर
वैसे कोई भी नेगेटिव न्यूज होती है तो बहुत जल्दी फैलती है लेकिन पॉजिटिव न्यूज के लिए भी अगर ढंग से काम किया जाए अपन लोगों ने पैसा कर सक लेवल ट्रांसप्लांट कर लिए और इसको भी सोसाइटी में प्रॉपर तरीके से कम्युनिकेट किया जाए कि अच्छे तरीके से हो रहा है और सबके सब सर्वाइव हुए या क्या है इसके बारे में बताया जाए इसकी सक्सेस रेट के बारे में तो लोगों का हौसला और बढ़ेगा और ये प्रोग्राम भी आगे बढ़ेगा और लोगों को इससे जीवन लाभ भी मिल सकेगा